Okay, uh, so uh, let's first get started with um, uh, Kasa. You actually had a question here. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, here, let me just... Okay, so you had a question. It was actually, uh, I got to find it again. 7.5, so page... Uh, page 361, uh, question two. So we're, we're back in electrostatics, which is fine. Um, so this question states that uh, two particles are at locations where the electric potential is the same. So we have two charges, let's call it uh, Q1 and Q2. And they're at a point where the potential, so V, is the same for both, okay? So they, they share the same potential. The question asks uh, whether or not these particles have the same electric potential energy. So is the electric potential energy on one equal to the electric potential energy on two? Okay. Now, in order to, like the way that I kind of visualize this, uh, what, I, what I would do is I would consider these particles to be a really big echo. Um, Okay, let me let me make sure. Uh, okay, test, test. It could just be where I'm located. Um, any better or not not better? So like here, there's a pretty big echo. Hmm. Um, does it sound the same for you, Aiden? Interesting. Um, maybe Costa just like refresh the YouTube stream. I don't know if that could be it, but. Jenna, are you experiencing any issues? Yeah. Okay. It's just you. Okay. Is it, is it, is it like bearable, uh, Costa? Like, is it okay? Tim, okay. Weird. Uh, do you, are you sure you don't have like multiple windows open with the same stream? Okay, so if you guys want to just remute your uh, microphones and then we'll, we'll keep it going. Uh, perfect. Okay, so um, as I was mentioning, so we have two charged particles, so Q1 and Q2. Uh, they're at the same potential, meaning if we assume that they're placed in a parallel plate capacitor, so the positive plate is at the top here, and suppose that the negative plate is at the bottom, that just means that they're in the same, or that they are the same distance 
away from the positive plate, right? So if they're at the same distance away from the positive plate, then they have the same uh, electric potential, okay? Now the formula that we have that describes the uh, electric potential um, at a given point in an electric field is the following. So we have the electric potential uh, the electric potential energy is defined as um, the voltage times the charge, right? So if they have the same potential, if they're at the same potential, but they have different charges, then they would have different electric potential energy. Okay, uh, Costa, how does that sound? Right, yeah, and, and, and that's sort of, I think it's maybe confusing because it's in that section of the textbook, right? It's in uh, section 7.5. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're considering, I mean, what you could do as well uh, instead is maybe have um, the following setup. So you have one point charge. Let's say this charge is kind of like fixed in space, right? Now, this point charge generates its own electric field. Okay, now if we look at a distance, um, let's say we look at a distance of R away from this point charge, and we consider a circle, um, a circular distance R around this point charge. Here, I'll center it a little bit there. Hey, not bad, not bad. Um, actually, we should put our charge right in the middle here. Q, there we go, there we go. Um, then let's consider two point charges on the, the same distance away from this point charge. So let's say Q1 and Q2, right? Now, based on the formula for the potential around a point charge, we know that V is equal to KQ, KQ, uh, or K big Q over R, right? So based on this formula, that means that both of these charges have the same potential, right? However, if we look at the electric potential energy between these two point charges, um, the electric potential energy is KQQ1 over R, and uh, the electric potential energy for this point charge is um, KQQ2 over R, right? So again, here you can see that if the two charges Q1 and Q2 are different, then the electric potential energy would be different at those two points. Okay, so so it doesn't have to be in a parallel plate capacitor, right? You could have a, a system of point charges, but um, the thing that you have to, to make sure about here is that the, um, the distances away are the same, meaning the potential is the same, but the electric potential energy doesn't have to be the same. Cool? Okay, excellent. So let us get into today's lesson. Now, today's lesson is definitely um, definitely a continuation of yesterday's lesson. Uh, we'll be talking about 8.4, and yeah, hopefully, there, hopefully this will give a little bit more intuition behind the right-hand rule, because ideally what we're going to do is, is try to... Uh, my, my entire goal is to come up with a reference frame that we can all kind of visualize around our desk here, okay? So I'm going to be using words like um, to the left or to the right or into the monitor just so we can all use our right hand in the exact same way and we should be able to all agree, um, okay? So ho hopefully, Jana, this this will help kind of develop that right hand rule intuition that we, we started developing yesterday, all right? Okay, so, um, so yesterday, the main uh, the main formula that we were kind of working with was this uh, magnetic force formula. Okay, so the magnetic force on a moving charged particle depends on the charge, the speed that the particle is moving at, the strength of the magnetic field, and the angle between the velocity vector and the uh, magnetic field vector. Okay. Um, and then we also noted, and, and we'll definitely work on it a bit more today, that the direction of the magnetic force is found using the right-hand rule, right? Uh, and, and from calculus, that implies that 
behind the scenes here, there, there is some sort of uh, cross product at work here, but we just don't have the mathematical tools quite yet to, to kind of develop all of that. Okay, that's more of a um, first year physics, uh, maybe even second year electricity and magnetism concepts. Okay. Um, so uh, we, I think we had an example yesterday where it was calculate the initial force and the initial acceleration of a proton in a magnetic field, right? Uh, the reason why we, we were kind of focused on the uh, initial force and the initial acceleration is that as soon as the proton or as soon as the charged particle starts to feel a force, what's going to end up happening is uh, it's going to uh, the it's going to accelerate, which means the velocity vector will change. And if the velocity vector is changing, that tells us that the force will also be changing. Okay, so that creates a problem because then we don't have a way of um, we we don't have a way of tracking where the particle will go in time because we have to update our force every step of the way. Right, so our force is constantly changing. Um, However, we can consider kind of a very constrained physical scenario, okay? So the scenario that we're gonna be considering here, so um, assume we have a charged particle and the charged particle enters a magnetic field, okay? Um, as it enters a magnetic field, as we saw yesterday, uh, it will experience a force, right? And that force is defined using um, this formula right here, okay? Uh, now, if the charged particle is traveling in the same direction uh, oh, I, I made a typo here. This should be sine uh, zero. Uh, sine zero uh, is equal to zero. Uh, so if the charged particle is traveling in the same direction as the magnetic field, it will experiencing it will experience no force since sine of zero is equal to zero. Um, if the charged particle is moving at a right angle to the magnetic field, so if the angle is equal to uh, 90 degrees, then um, then the force that it will experience will be perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. Okay, so let's get some practice with the right hand rule, shall we? Uh, so we have this this scenario laid out for us here. So we have a um, here we have our magnetic field. So the magnetic field um, here is directed into the page. Or okay, let, let's use let's use careful terminology here. Let's say the magnetic field is directed into the monitor. Okay, so directed into monitor. Now, the magnetic field is going to be our pointer finger. Okay, so here's our pointer finger. Uh, the velocity of this particle is moving to the left right based on our on our screens here okay so this is moving left okay and this is going to be our thumb okay so our thumb is responsible for the velocity all right so we have our thumb pointing to the left we have our magnetic field which is our pointer finger into the monitor okay which means that our point, uh, our middle finger is pointing straight down. And that is the force here. Okay. Does that does that kind of make sense how we're applying this right hand rule? Kind of okay. We'll we'll do we'll do some more. Um, but yeah, essentially, thumb is uh, is th yeah. We're getting centripetal force. Yep. Uh, thumb is velocity. Pointer finger is magnetic field. Middle finger is force. Okay, and that's that's always going to be always going to be the case for us. All right. Um, Yeah, so, but we'll, we'll practice this a little bit more and mostly we'll focus on what's gonna happen if we have like a negative particle, right? Um, actually, if this particle, instead of being positive, let's see what would happen if this particle was negative. So let's draw the exact same picture, okay? Um, we'll have a uh, negative particle instead moving 
to the left. Okay, so let me make that a little bit nicer. So we have a negative particle moving to the left, um, Q minus, let's say. Now, uh, let, let's keep the magnetic field still pointing into the, into the monitor here, okay? So let, let's try this again now, right? So, and actually, I, I should erase this circle here because it definitely will not be moving in a circle at this point. Um, so we have our, our velocity pointed to the left. So our thumb points to the left. Our pointer finger points into the monitor, okay? Now, based on the right-hand rule, our force should be directed downwards, right? However, because this is a negative particle, what ends up happening is the force flips direction, okay? So in this case, the force would be directed upwards. So Fm would be upward instead of downward, okay? So it's the same... It's the same setup, it's the same scenario, but um, our right-hand rule should predict it, it moving downwards. Instead, we have, to, we have to flip it, we have to move it upwards, okay? Uh, does that make sense, Jana? Is that a little bit more clear, uh, what we're doing there? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, Absolutely, yes. And actually, this this will uh, move in a circular motion. However, it will actually move uh, in the opposite way, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, and, and we will see more of this uh, later, later on today, all right? Um, yeah, we will definitely see what happens when we... Uh, send different charged particles into a magnetic field. We'll, we'll see what ends up happening, all right? Um, so stay tuned. Yes, it will experience uh, uniform circular motion, okay? Okay, so now here's one thing I wanna try. So again, set up, let, let's, let's kind of ignore, ignore this, this guy for a second. So we'll stick, to the, we'll stick to the positive case, shall we? Okay, so let's, let's stick with our positively charged particle. We'll, we'll move that off to the side. So let's focus more on this, okay? So as the, the force keeps, um, notice that the force is pointed towards the middle of this circle here, okay? Now, what this will do is it'll cause the velocity vector to change, right? So say when the particle is over here, the velocity vector will be pointed this way, okay? Now, uh, again, use your, use your thumb. Actually, I'll, I'll move it all the way around the circle here. So the velocity vector, let's say, is, is pointed downwards like this, okay? Okay, so grab your right hand. Our new velocity vector is pointed straight down, okay? So we have the thumb pointed straight down. We have the uh, magnetic field pointed into our monitor, which means our uh, magnetic force will act to the right in this picture. So our magnetic force will point this way. Okay, is that is that clear for everyone what I'm doing here? Okay, or I mean we can keep we can keep doing this right? Let's say the velocity now is pointed to the right. So the velocity pointed to the right, which means our thumb points to the right. Our magnetic field is still into the monitor, which means our force is in the upward direction, right? So our magnetic force points up this way. All right. And so hopefully what you're seeing at this point is that the magnetic force will always be directed towards the center of this circle that we've created, right? And so this should remind you of all the way back to chapter three, this thing is gonna be moving in a circle. It's gonna be undergoing uniform circular motion, right? Which tells us that the, the force that's responsible for keeping it moving in a circle is the magnetic force. So the centripetal force uh, is equal to the magnetic force, okay? And so what this allows us to do, um, if we plug in both of these formulas, so we have the magnetic force formula uh, QVB sine 90. Now, um, the velocity vector based on this picture right here, uh, the velocity vector is always going to be pointed perpendicularly to the uh, magnetic field, right? And so 
the angle between them is always going to be 90 degrees, which means that this piece here is always going to be equal to 1. Okay. And what that tells us, if we pop this over to the side, we have uh, QVB equals MV squared over R. And I can rearrange this thing. So I will have R is equal to MV squared over QVB. And I just cancel out a V and a V. So I will get MV over QB, which is the formula that I have down here. Okay. And so what this formula will allow us to predict is the radius at which this particle will start moving in a circle. Okay. Um, now you might be wondering, okay, like why do we care how this particle is moving? Uh, what we'll do uh, in, a, in a second here, once we get through our first example, just kind of illustrating this, um, we'll talk about mass spectrometers. So has everyone heard of a mass spectrometer before? Has anyone heard of it? Vaguely? Google it. How about you, Jenna? Have you heard of a mass spectrometer before? No, okay. Um, yes, yes. So it's essentially, um, it's a device that's used, because if you look at this formula, right, this formula depends on uh, a couple things here, right? Or, or rather the radius at which a particle will travel depends on a couple things. So um, specifically it depends on how fast the particle is moving, what the mass of the particle is and what the charge of the particle is, okay? And so if we send a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of particles with different masses and different charges, they'll move in a different circular pattern, right? The, the circles that they travel, the circles that they follow will have a different radius, okay? What this will allow us to do is give us a way of separating, um, separating out a whole collection of ions with different charges and different masses, okay? So that's the premise behind how a mass spectrometer works, okay? Um, we'll see that uh, much more um, when we get to the examples here, okay? Uh, and there's also another, uh, this is actually in the homework, uh, as well as in your assignment, I think. There's another type of device called a velocity selector, uh, which is also very cool. Um, so that's another kind of example, or rather uh, application of this concept here, okay? Um, so we can, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to kind of go through a homework problem uh, based on velocity selector. I think I actually made one of them the uh, problem of the day, okay? Okay, uh, so let's get to an example here. Um, and this example is, is a good one because it actually incorporates uh, material that was covered in chapter seven, so electricity, um, as well as the new sort of magnetism material that we're, we're chatting about now, okay? So here we have an electron that starts from rest, so V, V1 is equal to zero. Uh, a horizontally directed electric field um, accelerates the electron, oh, I made a typo here, uh, through a potential difference of 37 volts. So the, the electric potential is 37 volts, or the potential difference is 37 volts. The electron leaves the electric field and then moves into a magnetic field. Uh, the magnetic field strength is 0 0.26 Tesla directed into the page, okay? And then we have a few different parts to analyze here, right? So we have to determine the speed of the electron at the moment it enters the magnetic field, okay? So let's first down, write down all the things that we know, right? So uh, we know that V1 is equal to zero. Um, we know that the potential difference is 37 volts. Okay. Uh, we know that um, when it enters the uh, magnetic field, the magnetic field strength is uh, 0 0.26 Tesla. Okay. And now for part, uh, for part A here, what we're looking for is the final speed of the electron. So we're looking for V2. Okay. So uh, let, let's kind of draw this out. All right. So um, here we initially have the electron at a or I guess we can we can say the electron, let's say starting over here, 
Um, we can imagine this as being like, say, a negative plate of a parallel plate capacitor. And so it's being attracted towards the positive plate of a parallel plate capacitor, okay? But this positive plate, it'll actually have a little gap um, that will allow the particle to exit, okay? So part A is all about looking for what the speed of the electron is uh, as, it, as it moves out of the, uh, the zone, right? So our delta V is 37 volts, okay? And we're looking for what V2 is, all right? And then once it actually gets into this new zone, there'll be a magnetic field there, but we'll worry about that when we get to part B, okay? So that's a setup to this, uh, this question here, all right? Okay, so let's first tackle what the final, uh, the, the final speed will be. So this is just a conservation of energy problem, right? This is like one of our main types of questions from chapter, uh, from chapter seven, okay? So at the start of the problem, the electron is not moving, right? So it does not have any uh, kinetic energy, right? EK is zero. It will have some electric potential energy, okay? Now, when it reaches the uh, positive plate, it will certainly have some kinetic energy, right? EK is not gonna be zero anymore, but the electric potential energy um, will have changed some, right? So we'll have an EE1 and an EE2, uh, but the electric potential energy will have uh, decreased in some, in some way, right? Because we're moving through a potential, all right? So part A, we're gonna uh, apply conservation of energy. Uh, before I get started with the actual calculations, do we have any questions about the setup here? So that's because, um, I mean, there, there are a few different ways to do this, but because I have, I know the potential, right? And I know what the charge is, right? I know that I'm dealing with an electron. I can actually apply this formula from chapter seven, right? And what this formula allows me to find is the change in electric potential energy, right? But that electric potential energy has to go somewhere, right? And, and it turns out that that electric potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy, okay? And now because I'm looking for the speed of the electron, I'm, I'm interested in what the kinetic energy of the electron will be as it leaves uh, this system here. Right. The electric potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy. Okay, this, this is kind of analogous to kind of tie it back to, to things that we're comfortable with. This is analogous to, I hold the pen up, right? When, I, when I'm holding this pen up, it has uh, some amount of gravitational potential energy, right? Now, when I let this grab, when I let this pen go, that gravitational potential energy will get converted into kinetic energy, right? In a, in a similar way here, uh, what's happening with this example is I have the electron, and you can imagine I'm holding the electron close to the negative plate, so it has a high electric potential energy, right? Now, when I let that electron go. It'll, it'll want to speed up, right? Because it's getting repelled from this negative plate. Okay, so that means it'll pick up speed as it, as it goes. So this is, you can, you want to think about this the same way as you would like, oh, we're holding a rock 10 meters above the ground. What is its gravitational potential energy? And then what is its kinetic energy or what is its speed when it hits the ground? It's the same type of problem. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's apply our conservation of energy formula here, okay? So um, I might need a bit more room here. Okay, it's echoing again. Anyone else echoing? Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, cool. Um, okay, okay, this is good.
I think to to possibly remove uh, to to remove any echo, what you guys could do is wear headphones, right? That that would remove all the echo. But up to you guys. Up to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's let's get to this. All right. So. Uh, when the electron is at the at the positive plate, or sorry, when the electron is at the negative plate, so our E1, our E1 will equal uh, E2, so when it gets to the positive plate. So now at the negative plate, it will have only the initial electric energy, okay? Uh, the initial electric potential energy. Now when it reaches the other plate, it will have a combination of... Um, kinetic energy and electric potential energy, possibly electric potential energy, okay? And so what we can do is we can actually rearrange this formula uh, to get, um, to kind of get what we want, right? Because ideally we want to be able to apply this delta EE is equal to negative Q delta V formula, okay? So that means we have to rearrange this formula to get uh, a E, E2 minus an EE1 out of this, okay? So let's let's kind of rearrange this thing. So I'm gonna bring, uh, let's bring this guy over to this side and we'll bring the kinetic energy over to the other side, okay? So I have uh, EK or negative EK equals EE2. Yeah, th there's a there are a bunch of different ways of, of rearranging this. Okay, and so when I do this, I get, uh, I notice here on this, on the left, on the right hand side of this equation here, I have my delta EE, right? I have the final electric potential energy minus the initial electric potential energy. So I have minus EK equals delta EE, okay? Or EK is equal to negative delta EE. And I get that by just taking this negative sign and, uh, and moving it over to the other side there, okay? And so now what I can do is I can actually use the formula uh, for the change in electric potential energy in terms of the charge and the potential difference, okay? So I'm gonna plug that formula into the right-hand side of this equation. So I get EK is equal to negative, and then the formula is negative Q delta V. Okay. So when I bring this up here, I'm going to get a um, EK is equal to Q delta V, which is gonna be equal to the charge of the um, particle times the uh, potential difference. All right, let's see what we get from there. Costa, what did you get? Oh, you did, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We could do it all in one swoop. Um, but yeah, when I calculate the kinetic energy, I get 5.928 uh, times 10 to the negative 18 joules. So that's how much kinetic energy the electron will have when it reaches the positive plate here, okay? Now we know the formula for kinetic energy, right? We know that uh, uh, EK equals one half times the mass of the electron times the velocity squared. Okay, and I can rearrange this formula. So 2EK divided by the mass of the electron, and then the whole thing, I'm gonna square root, and that'll get me my velocity. Okay, so velocity square root two times 5.928, whoops. Okay, so my velocity is cost. Now, what did you get? Nice. 
So 3.6 uh, times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So it's actually moving pretty fast when it reaches the positive plate. Okay. Okay, any questions about how I found the speed of the particle as it leaves the, uh, as it falls through this potential? Um, any questions about how I found that? Or do we feel pretty good? Pretty good? Excellent, okay, cool. Yeah, like what, what you could have done, or yeah, go ahead Costa. Yeah, so I think you end up getting something that looks like this, right? So V2. Something that looks like that? Yep, yeah. So again, there, there's so many... Oh, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah there, there's so many like sort of sub formulas that we have. Um, Again, your formula sheet has has kind of all of them, right? So, so this also works, right? The 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 main difference here is that we're considering, and actually, it, it's equivalent, right? It, it definitely is equivalent. Um, here we're using the work energy theorem. Okay, so the work that's being done on the charge um, allows us to figure out what the kinetic energy of the charge will be. Okay. Okay, so I think that answers part A, right? So part A, we have figured out the speed of the electron at the moment that it enters the magnetic field, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna copy all of this and then bring it down so I give myself a little bit more room here. Okay, so my goal from here now, I wanna figure out what's gonna happen when the particle um, leaves this this region, right? When it when it leaves this zone, okay. So when it enters this area to the to the left, or sorry, to the right of the the positively charged plate here, um, it's going to enter a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is directed. Um, it's directed into the page, right? So that means we have a magnetic field that's directed into the page, right? And this magnetic field, let's say it's uniform throughout all of this region over here, okay? So the magnetic field is a constant value, or the magnetic field strength is constant all throughout this region, all right? Okay, so now what we have to do is we have to consider, um, I think we're looking for what the radius of the or determine the magnitude and direction of the magnetic force on the electron and then determine the radius of the uh, circular path, okay? So what's gonna end up happening? Let's, let's break out our right-hand rule here, okay? So we have our velocity is going to the right, our magnetic field is going into the page, right? So based on our right-hand rule, our middle finger is gonna point up, right? So our, our magnetic force would be up. However, because we're dealing with an electron here, we flip it. So the magnetic force points down. Okay, so again, our um, thumb points in the direction of the velocity, right? So there's our thumb. Our, um, our pointer finger points in the direction of the magnetic field. And then our uh, middle finger or the the opposite direction of our middle finger will give us the magnetic force okay so let's figure out what the magnetic force is going to be so part b we have to figure out what uh fm is going to be okay well we already know what the direction is going to be right we know that the direction is going to be um based on our picture here the direction is down right according to right hand rule 
to right hand rule, RHR, right hand rule. Okay. Um, let's figure out what the magnitude of the magnetic force is going to be. Okay, so Fm is equal to QVB sine theta. Okay. In this case, the, the velocity and the magnetic field, they're oriented perpendicularly to each other, right? So the, the angle between them is 90 degrees. So that means we have Fm is equal to Q, that's our charge, times the speed, that's the part, or that's what we found in part A, right? So um, 3.607, or Six six eight point one two three times the magnetic field strength. That's zero point two six Tesla. Okay, let's plug this in and see what we get. So we have um, we have a magnetic force of one point five zero two eight three one. 4, 4, 7 times 10 to the negative 13 newtons, or approximately 1.5 times 10 to the negative 13 newtons. So we have found our magnetic force. Okay. Okay, last but not least, we are trying to figure out uh, the radius of um, the motion here. So what I'll do is I'll copy this part when the electron is out of the, um, when the electron moves into the magnetic field, okay? Now what's gonna end up happening is, because it experiences a force um, directed perpendicular to the motion, uh, it's actually going to move in a circular motion pattern like this, okay? And our job is to figure out what the radius yeah, it probably would be a pretty large radius. Yeah, because the, the velocity is, is so high, right? And the mass is so low. Or wait, does it depend on mass? What's the formula? No, the mass is so low, the velocity is so high, but the charge is pretty minuscule. Yeah, so you would expect a, a pretty tiny, or a, a pretty large radius, I would say. Um, so our job is to figure out what this radius value is, right? So to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the formula that we wrote down right at the beginning of uh, our discussion here, right? So R is equal to MV over QB, all right? So we have our mass of the electron. Uh, the speed that it's moving at is what we found uh, up here in part A. So um, times 3,607,668. Uh, our charge is just the charge of our electron. And then the magnetic field strength is 0 0.26 Tesla. All right, so we can plug that in. So we get constant O3 times uh, 3607668 over uh, constant. Actually, I get a pretty small radius. I get 7.88917. No, no. The neg again, the negative in, in all of these formulas, the negative is going to tell us something about direction, but it doesn't really... Because if we put a negative into this formula, we would get a negative radius, which doesn't really make sense, right? The negative is defining our direction. Uh, it's not really telling us anything about the, the, the value of the radius or the value of the magnetic force. Okay, so we get a radius value of approximately 7.9 times, oops. Okay, and that is the radius of the path that the electron will follow when it, when it, uh, when it enters this magnetic field, all right? Okay, any questions about that? Or is that all pretty good? Good. Aiden, Jenna, you guys are good? Awesome.
left hand rule you definitely could yeah let's try it out so yeah and instead of the right hand rule use the left hand rule exactly yeah so let's, let's try it here so here i'm using my left hand i have my velocity is pointed to the right i have the magnetic field pointed into the monitor which means my electric force is or sorry my magnetic force is pointed downward so you can definitely use your left hand rule for a negatively charged particle and it gives you the right answer so instead of the right hand rule you would use your left hand for negatively charged particles but the 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 fingers are the same, right? Your thumb is still the velocity. Your pointer finger on your left hand is still the magnetic field. And your middle finger is still the magnetic force. But left hand would be used for negatively charged particles. So you could, you could use that. Um, yeah, up to you guys. Okay, next example, shall we? Let's take a look here. Okay, so as I, as I kind of mentioned, um, as, as we sort of introed already, uh, one application of this uh, phenomenon here is a mass spectrometer, okay? So uh, a mass spectrometer, Aiden, as, as I think you mentioned earlier, uh, is a substance or is a instrument that allows researchers to analyze samples um, and, and that, that can give them a bunch of information, right? So it can, uh, allow them to figure out the elemental composition of a, a certain substance um, or the masses of particles within a substance or the, uh, Aiden, I think you mentioned the charge to mass uh, ratio, which, which will or mass to charge ratio, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so let's, let's actually kind of visualize what's going to happen here. Okay. So here we have a, a charge entering a uniform magnetic field. Okay. <clears throat> and let's say instead of just a single charge, let's imagine having a bunch of charges okay so we have a we have like i don't know say like a cloud or a beam of charged particles that are entering this magnetic field but the mass and the charge of all these particles might be different okay so you might have i don't know let's say you have some carbon atoms or carbon ions and you then have some magnesium ions and those those have different charges on them right um and and they also have different atomic masses and so you would have a, uh, because they have different masses and they have different charge, they would have a different radius when they enter this magnetic field, okay? So let, let's, let's imagine, let's say instead of just one particle, we have a collection of particles. So when they enter the magnetic field, let's say, the, let's say there's a mixture of both positively, uh, if we have, let, let's say we send a positively charged particle into this, right? If it has a large mass, that would tell us that the radius is going to be larger. Okay, so let's say this charged particle enters the magnetic field. So the velocity is to the right, the magnetic field is into the monitor, which means our force is directed upwards. So this particle will move uh, in a circle like this. Okay, yeah, let me make that a bit clearer. All right. So let's say this is a, a large mass, all right? Large mass implies a uh, large radius, okay? But then let's say in this collection of particles, we also have some smaller mass particles thrown in there, okay? Um, so they might do something like this, right? Smaller mass equals smaller radius. But this could also, notice that this formula also depends on charge as well, right? So um, we could say, rather than mass, because it depends on both mass and charge, we could say it has a large mass to charge ratio, okay? And a smaller, instead of a smaller mass, we can say that it has a smaller mass to charge ratio. Okay, so that's where a positively, bo both of these are, uh, are positively charged particles, right? So if it gets deflected upwards, the, um, it's positively charged particles. OK, 
Okay. Um, if these particles get deflected downwards, so something that looks like this, then they would be negatively charged. Okay, so uh, Aiden, as you said, for, for these ones, we could use the left hand, right? So velocity is pointed to the right, magnetic field is into the monitor, which means our force is directed downwards, which we see here. Um, so these would be for negatively charged particles. The greater the mass to charge ratio is, the greater the radius will be when it enters the magnetic field. Which means the higher, if, if it has a higher mass to charge ratio, it will actually experience less deflection than something with a smaller mass to charge ratio would. Okay. I, I know that seems kind of weird. Think about it sort of like if, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like an analogy to something that we would experience in like everyday life. Uh, let's say we have, um, hmm. Let's say we have like two really heavy, uh, like, or let's say we have a really heavy hockey player and then he's getting hit from the side, let's say, okay? Well, if the hockey player is really heavy, the one that's hitting him won't, won't deflect him very much, right? Um, he'll, he'll kind of stay on the same track that he would uh, normally, right? Like the, the guy that's hitting him would kind of just bounce off of him. However, if the guy that was skating was really light, he would get deflected off his track much more, right? Um, and so this is kind of the same idea. A really heavy charged particle uh, won't really be deflected as much as a really light charged particle, okay? Or um, something that has a smaller charge uh, won't be deflected as much as something that is uh, more has more charge on it. Okay, so that's sort of the significance of the mass to charge ratio. It determines how much deflection it will experience when it enters the magnetic field, or how much what the radius will be of this circular motion when it enters the magnetic field. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Let's get into an example. All right. So a researcher is using a mass spectrometer and the researcher observes, uh, let's say a, a particle or a stream of particles that are traveling at 1.6 times 10 to the six meters per second. So our speed is 1.6 times 10 to the six meter per second uh, in a circular path of radius 8.2 centimeters. So radius is 8.2 centimeters, which is 0 0.082 meters. Uh, the spectrometer's magnetic field is perpendicular to the particle's path and has a magnitude of 0 0.41 tesla. So the magnitude of the magnetic field is 0 0.41 tesla. Uh, we have to figure out what the mass to charge ratio is. So we have to figure out what mass divided by charge is. Mass to charge ratio. Okay. And then what we'll do once once we actually find the mass to charge ratio, we'll compare it against this table to figure out the particle or the, in this case, we're looking at isotopes of hydrogen. What isotope of hydrogen uh, the researcher concludes that they have in their sample, okay? Okay, so let's kind of get to this. Uh, we know that the radius is equal to uh, mv over, over qb, right? Using this formula right here. Right? And what I want to do is I want to isolate for the mass divided by the charge, the mass to charge ratio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move both the uh, magnetic field strength and the velocity. I'm going to move those over to the other side. Okay. So I will get um, RB over V is equal to the mass to charge ratio. Okay. And now I can plug in the, the quantities that I know here. So M over Q is equal to R, which is 0 0.082 uh, times the magnetic field strength, 0 0.41, divided by the uh, speed that the particles are moving at. All right, let's put that in, see what we get. Nice, yep. Yeah. 
and the units for that will be kilogram per coulomb, right? Because it's a mass divided by a charge, mass unit divided by charge unit, okay? And so what we do is we, uh, yeah, kind of, a, kind of a strange unit, but again, we don't, it's not really an S or it's, it's not really like an essential unit for us. Um, it's sort of a specific unit for this circumstance, right? Okay. So we compare this to the table up top and we notice that we are dealing with, um, some deuterium atoms in this max spectrometer here. All right. Cause they, they match up quite nicely. So the particles that we're dealing with are deuterium. All right. So this is how a mass spectrometer works in practice, right? We know, uh, say we have a, a detector that's figuring out where these particles are landing. We know where the beam is originating. And so we can kind of um, use the information that we're getting about the trajectory of the particles to actually calculate what the mass and what the, or what the mass to charge ratio of these particles will be, okay? So this is where this is applicable in mass spectrometers, all right? Where, where this theory is applicable for mass spectrometers, all right? Okay, so I have one more example. Um, this one's kind of a similar example. And then that's it, that's all I got. So yeah, pretty much right on time. Uh, a researcher uses a mass spectrometer in a carbon dating experiment. The incoming ions are a mixture of carbon-12 ions and carbon-14 ions. Uh, so we know what the speed is. So we have a speed of 1.0 times 10 to the 5. Okay. Uh, the strength of the magnetic field is 0 0.1 Tesla. Uh, the mass, and then we're given a whole bunch of information about the masses of the, the particles. Um, again, we, you'd be given this on a test, let's say. But we have the mass of the electron, uh, mass of a proton, and mass of a neutron. Um, so f the, the idea here is because these, ma uh, because these particles have different masses, right? Because these two isotopes have different masses, what's going to end up happening is they're going to be deflected in a different radius. Okay, so let's draw, let's draw what this thing will look like. Um, we have, yeah, yeah, sounds good, no problem. Yep, we're, we're pretty much done here, yeah. Cool, yep, sounds good. Okay, um, so what's gonna happen here is Notice that the charge on both of these particles, they're both, they both have a pop, uh, like a plus one charge, right? Uh, so that means the charge is the same. However, the masses are gonna be different, right? I say here, uh, note the carbon 12 ion has six protons, six neutrons, and five electrons. And the carbon 14 ion has six protons, eight neutrons, and five electrons. So while the charges are the same, the masses will be different, okay? In fact, the charge on both of these, because it's just a plus one charge, the charge for both of these is just gonna be plus our elementary charge, right? So plus E, so plus 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, okay? However, the masses will be different, okay? So our, our first step should be, let's figure out what the masses are, and then we could kind of draw in what's gonna happen when they enter this, uh, enter this magnetic field, okay? So um, let's, let's do a couple calculations here. So let's say we have a carbon 12 and carbon 14. Okay, so carbon 12 is composed of uh, six protons, um, six neutrons, and uh, five electrons. Okay, um, carbon 14 is composed of uh, six protons, again, eight, eight neutrons this time, uh, but still five electrons, because they have the same, they have the same ionic charge, all right? And so what we want to do is we want to figure out what the, what the total mass of carbon-12 and what the total mass of carbon-14 is going to be, okay? Now to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, six times the mass of the proton plus six times the mass of a neutron 
plus five times the mass of an electron. And then over here, we're gonna do um, six times the mass of the proton, plus eight times the mass of a neutron, plus five times the mass of an electron, all right? Okay, so let's figure out what these will be. Um, So for carbon-12, I get a mass of 2.00898 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. And for, um, for carbon-14, so I'm adding two neutrons to it, so it'll be slightly heavier, I get a mass of 2.34 um, Three nine seven times ten to the negative twenty six kilograms. Okay. So what that means is that the carbon fourteen atom will actually experience less deflection than the carbon uh, twelve atom because the carbon fourteen atom is is heavier than the carbon twelve atom. Okay. So what's going to end up happening if if you have a carbon fourteen? Uh, atom coming in, Let, let's draw that in red here, it will uh, follow the following trajectory. So it'll go in a, in a circular motion, right? Um, and it'll hit somewhere up here. So this this distance here, let, let's say we call it, uh, we'll call it R14, okay? Uh, however, you will also have um, carbon-12 atoms coming in, right? So our C12 atoms, because those are lighter, they'll actually actually experience less deflection, right? So they'll they'll still go in a circular pattern, but they won't go quite as far. The radius that they'll follow is actually going to be less. Okay, so this will be we call this R12, let's say. Okay, and so now our job we we want to figure out what both R12 and what R14 are going to be. Okay, so that's that's our job right now. All right, to figure that out, I'm gonna use the, um, the the same formula that I have been using, right? R equals MV over QB. So let's do two separate calculations. R12 um, equals M12 times the velocity over the charge times the magnetic field strength. R14, M14 times the speed over the charge times the magnetic field strength. Now I'm just gonna plug in all my numbers here. So 2.00 blah, 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 times the speed, 1.0 times 10 to the five over the charge. So that's our E times uh, our magnetic field strength, 0 0.1 Tesla. Okay. And similarly, R14, Okay, so I'm gonna plug in both of these and we'll see what we get. Uh, so for R14, I get a value of 0 0.1462925. And then for R12, I get a value of 0 0.12539, oh, my units here, radius, meters, uh, 0 0.6.82 meters, okay? And what this question is asking is, uh, how far must the detector move between detecting the two different types of ions that we have, okay? So we're not interested in either of these. What we're interested in is the difference between them. So we actually want to figure out this delta R value here, all right? So our delta R value is just uh, R14 minus R12. And so I'm just going to subtract these two values here. So uh, 
I get a value of 0 0.02090844 or approximately uh, meters or approximately uh, 0 0.021 meters. And that is my answer. All right. And so what we can, the, the, the way that we can kind of use this, um, we can figure out uh, exactly uh, what the, the entire substance is composed of, right? So we can use this to figure out say the ratio between uh, the amount of carbon-12 and the amount of carbon-14 that's present in this sample, okay? Uh, and specifically, this is a carbon dating experiment, so it'd be used to determine the age of, say, like a fossil or something like that. Um, yeah, but another, another example of where mass spectrometry would be, would be used in, in everyday life, okay? Any questions on that example? or I guess any questions about today's class in general, because that's it. Um, 7.5, if you if you guys turn to it, uh, seven or sorry, 8.5 rather. 8.5 is just applications of magnetic fields. Uh, so if you want, you can actually use this as sort of, um, if, if you want to research one of these in, in depth for your, uh, the final question on your assignment, feel free. That's, that's a good option. You can use this as a jumping off point, but um, beyond that point, or, or beyond that, there's there's kind of no new calculations or anything in 8.5. So, yeah. 